and I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series. And it's where we explore the experiences of individuals from different Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and hear their experiences of belonging in their environment, which they now find themselves. And this week is an exception. Well, it's never an exception. We always have exceptional guests and this week we've got another one in Hector Kayu and Hector is a professor of biochemistry um, at the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial College but Hector's so much more he's an educator he's a he's a philosopher he's he's all of those things above um, Hector I just want to welcome you today to this week's edition of Belonging um, and I'd like to just kick off by asking you the question, which is, when you were growing up, where did you get your sense of belonging from? Well, thanks, Wayne. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this, this series. Um, where did I get my sense of belonging from? Uh, well, I think like most of us, you know, it comes from family in the first instance. Um, and, you know, my family was, uh, an immigrant family you know both my parents were from Malaysia um, but came to London in the 70s and I, I grew up in London grew up in South London um, uh, actually in an environment where uh, you know many many families um, that, that you know many of the children I mixed with their parents were born in another country you know mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> so it didn't feel un that didn't feel unusual at all at the time mm -hmm. In fact, it felt more like the norm, and um, I think there's quite a lot of us <clears throat> who would have grown up in London around that time, in the sort of uh, 70s, 80s, uh, you know, would recognise that, that, you know, you, you did tend to congregate in certain areas and where, you know, you'd have a very large, you know, Asian or, or black population. That was certainly the case um, in the areas where I grew up initially around Tooting yeah. and, and that sort of area. Um, but yeah, so my family, you know, I guess, uh, and this sort of blends into belonging and also the sense of your sense of identity, I guess, um, Wayne, is that I certainly, so yeah, I certainly associated with coming from an immigrant family. Yeah. Um, I was raised a Catholic and went to Catholic schools. So that was also, yeah. I guess, part of it. Um, uh, but beyond that, uh, yeah, I suppose it was being a Londoner first and foremost, I think <laughs> that sort of defines it and probably still today defines it even though um i don't really live in london anymore but uh, uh at heart i'm still a londoner um and then uh, yeah i mean beyond that it's, it's it's a sort of british identity really a very i mean actually and actually thinking about it and especially when you know working at somewhere like imperial where you work mm -hmm. with people from all over the world yeah um you realize that yeah a lot of your memories and the things your touchstone that you go back to is is actually very british experiences you know all yeah. your social references are from british culture that yeah. Period. so yeah yeah very much british londoner first and foremost um but then also acutely being aware of coming from an immigrant background with parents who you know came to the country with not very much yeah. you know my mum came in a, a age of 21 to work in the nhs as a nurse like many many yeah um people from Asia and around the world. Um, my dad, again, just a couple of years older, but had already served quite a few years in the British Army in yeah. Singapore before he came to the UK. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, and so basically th that sense of belonging were very much, it was about the family, about the nuclear family. I had two yeah. younger sisters. Yeah. But we were a unit and it was about looking after ourselves, each other, and obviously then also in with the community as well, which was probably more around the church as well yeah uh, yeah so, so you got a sense of your sense of belonging was about the fact that um working hard because you were from an immigrant background as it were but at the same time because everybody around you had mm. would you say everyone around you had that same kind of ethos that we have to work hard or or was that something particular to your family i didn't know it didn't feel like that it felt like you know that was didn't you know it was definitely something that seemed to be common amongst everybody, you know, at least yeah. the people we grew up with and mixed with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes the everyday did feel like a struggle. Yeah. You know, certainly for my parents. I mean, I, I have to say, I've, I've, looking back on it, I think I was relatively shielded from a lot of the 
stresses and strains and worries that you know my parents and I guess anyone my parents generation had yeah starting in this country um but yeah you were aware of it you were aware of the fact that money was tight you were I was you know I didn't see that much of my dad you know he'd always be after the army he went and worked for British telecoms telecoms engineer and yeah he'd be always pulling extra shifts always on the weekends evenings whatever so you, you know you you wouldn't see your folks a lot and mum would be doing night shifts as, as a nurse as well so you'd be aware that um um it life wasn't easy and um certainly that was these were common experiences amongst everybody at least, yeah. you know, uh, um, so and i guess the immigrant point of it is that you uh, and i'm suppose I'm, I'm i'm very aware of it now again when i look at my my colleagues and friends who come to this country more recently they still mm. face many challenges things like not having parental support to look after yeah. your family i mean it makes yeah. a huge difference i mean uh, I've been very lucky and fortuitous in, in having that support. So yeah. um, in hindsight, you look back and you think, yeah, actually, th it was quite difficult. So definitely there was a sense that you had to work hard um, to, you know, to, for yourself, but for your family as well. Um, but I think one thing that comes from being, you know, um, you know maybe is, 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 is more, slightly more prevalent amongst some of the, you know, um, ethnic minorities um, at that time, they really saw education as a way out of that, right? So you know, that that was a message that came through very strongly um, that, you know, by achieving academically, you were going to have a route to a better life. And that was a very big part of why they, yeah. my parents had come to the country and they, yeah. they did remind us of that quite often. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it, the expectation was that through achieving academically, you know, you'd be able to, Get yourself on a, on, a, on a good track and also your whole family would be yeah. lifted up along along the way so so it was about working hard but there was a pathway that they could see through education so education was a a potential key for alleviating yeah, I, some of the stress sizzle yeah. uh, absolutely i don't and i don't think we were particularly unusual in that yeah I think, you know uh i think a lot of families you know, think that way, or at least they certainly did. But I think, I think it's probably more acute for my people of sort of my parents' background because they didn't have access to that education, right? So yeah. they see it as something that they saw it as something that much more precious. Yeah. Um, something that if you got the opportunity, you had to try and take it. Yeah. Um, something you know, and again, in hindsight, it's easy to say I agree, but probably at the time, you don't quite realize how lucky you were to have the chances you had. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so that came through. So I think it's the fact that they, yeah, they had to leave. They didn't get to do past fifth form and and didn't get to really build, you know, a whole range of ambitions. They mm -hmm. they thought it was imperative to have their kids do that because they could also see, you know, they could see some of the benefits of that. Certainly mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, looking around at the more middle class families around, you know, yeah, it was natural that yeah. you did a certain level of education and certain opportunities from that. So there was a certain degree of wanting to emulate that as well. Yeah. So you said that you went to grew up as a Catholic and you went to Catholic mm. school. Yeah. What was the, what was the environment like for you there in the Catholic school and where you pushed where you were you pushed into education? Did did you enjoy education? What was it? I think no, I don't think I don't think we were there was a lot of pushing mm -hmm. as such. I mean, it was some, in, you know, I think you were given a lot of encouragement mm -hmm. and support, I think, you know, along the way been yeah very fortunate have some really good teachers who tried always to get the best out of everyone mm -hmm. trying to help you maximize get the most out of your talents which i think is you know the heart of great schooling great education um but no i guess the interest came from myself i suppose i was mm -hmm. a bit geeky i did love <laughs> reading and <laughs> computing and science and loved puzzles and and all and love solving puzzles and i think you know that, that sort of at the heart of what sort of made me interested in science from an early age and um what led me to enjoy it all the way through to um, a career. But I mean, the school obviously did have an influence. I mean, you know, it, again, principally probably because of the kinds of people that it attracted. So being in that part of the world, mm -hmm. you know, we, it, it, you know, it really meant that, yes, again, it was just another factor, meaning that we had a very high immigrant population, you know, that yeah. most of the families, parents came from another country. You know, uh, most of the white kids in the school were Irish, you know, right, or yeah. Polish or Italian or, you know, so even with, you know, not, not considering, um, 
you know, uh, ethnicity in, in perhaps the most immediately obvious way, mm -hmm. it was still very, very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, again, contributed to that idea that, you know, um, uh, uh, diversity was normal, I guess, in mm -hmm. a sense, and that you were on a journey of progression for most mm -hmm. of these families from humbler beginnings to maybe something with great, you know, greater uh, opportunity. It's quite an aspirational environment, I suppose, in some ways. And and one with travels as well. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all a bed of roses in mm -hmm. that part of London at that time. Mm -hmm. Right, there, there was genuinely a lot of struggles and tensions and difficulties in some of those areas as you know i'm sure anyone growing up in london at that time would, would be able to tell you yeah so but you found did you find would can i say did you find solace in in education did you in what was it that because i think solace would be stretching it too far because i really you know i, I enjoyed my childhood you know yeah um, and weirdly despite perhaps objectively what was you know uh, perhaps more crime in the streets and everything else we were uh, afforded a lot of freedom you know you'd right. at, a, at the 10 11 year old you know you'd get on your bike and say right i'm off mum i'll see you to dinner and you'd be out the whole day and yeah. it would just be fine that'd be normal and i don't think parents on average do that in the yeah. middle of london these days right <laughs> so so actually we've afforded a lot of freedom so no i think solace is is, is probably not the right word i think mm -hmm. um i just genuinely enjoyed it i genuinely yeah. enjoyed learning um um what always wanted to find out new things and uh and yeah, and managed to be given enough freedom and space to do that and enough support at home to just get on and enjoy it, yeah. So that's that's really interesting. And I, I was, when we had our discussion and we spoke mm. about being growing up in London and at the times with the troubles and, and stuff mm. like that. But then um, when you got on into sixth form and you were then thinking about going did you always have the aspirations to go to university and and how did that pan out with your friends friendship groups and stuff like that yeah so um i i wouldn't say it was always like a, a burning desire right but it was just a sort of um again coming with that sort of expectation from your my parents that mm -hmm. if you wanted to progress and get on then it would mm -hmm. involve at some point going doing something like going on to university or mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to. I think going to Oxford, mm -hmm. where I eventually ended up, um, mm -hmm. that was something slightly different. And mm -hmm. you know, obviously, my parents, not having gone through higher education, second, you know, sixth form education, secondary education, uh, higher education, they, you know, I mean, it's still the case today. Probably, if you ask all around the world someone to name a British university, they'd say Oxford, yeah. Cambridge, right? Yeah. So. Um, they knew it was something important and, and desirable. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably the same for me. And so, yeah, I made that um, decision to give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, without really understanding the significance of that. Okay. I think, I think if I'd understood just how significant Oxbridge is for British culture, um, I, I might have been psyched out of it, but I, I really was just ignorant of it. I didn't really understand what it was all about or what the difference was. I just knew it was something that people thought of it if you were very able that's where you might try and go yeah. um and so it decided to give it a go did you get that kind of support and encouragement from because if, if your parents didn't know about it there's just oh. this notion um did you get support from the school and everything like that to I, give I, you that aspiration to say it, you should be going a bit of a mix mm -hmm. i mean i i benefited from a fantastic um chemistry teacher who mm -hmm. was really really good and and gave lots of extra support and yeah we did so we did get a little bit of extra support and extra things in lunch breaks you know to mm -hmm. go and do another a practice paper or something and mm -hmm. so the, the individual teachers there were really really supportive um i did get a bit unstuck with when the head of sixth form they sort of run mock interviews and did actually I mentioned I wanted to think of applying to Oxford and said, okay, so we did a sort of mock interview and he sort of said afterwards, well, you know, Hex, I, I just don't think you're the sort of chap that should really be applying to, to Oxford. I think he'd been to Oxford himself. Yeah. And so, but interestingly, I, and I know every individual is different. When I mm -hmm. hear things like that and someone saying you can't do something, it just makes me really hard to prove them wrong. So and certainly at the time, I think a little less, but I think the chip on the shoulder's left, gone a little bit now, but I, I was just desperate to prove them wrong. And I was really lucky. And I suppose this is the first sort of example of where genuine luck comes in that actually the head of sixth form changed while I was there. Yeah. 
a new um, person who came in at Michael's side, who was really hugely supportive um, mm -hmm. and just said, yeah, absolutely, give it a go. And, you know, uh, and I was very fortunate to, yeah, pass the exams, pass the interviews and, and get the opportunity to go off. Yeah. So how did, yeah, sorry, sorry. No. go on, no, go on. No, I was just going to say about friendship groups, it was quite <laughs> interesting because there, there was a, you, you mentioned, I, I realised I didn't answer the question, but there was a split, of course, then between some of my friends that went to university, some that didn't. Mm. Um, I, reckon, I suppose it was about 50-50, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not quite as much as that. But um, yeah, I think uh, I've been quite fortunate to keep in touch with, um, you know, a lot of my mates from school mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and that would include people from both camps. So yeah. I think... Um, you know, when you do have that, your sense of identity, actually, or belonging comes a lot from your friendships. That's yeah. something that's been from that age all the way through. Um, if that is belonging and where who you are, it doesn't necessarily, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to have the geography that you can keep in touch with people, yeah. um, you don't necessarily lose that. Or yeah. it doesn't have to be that way when you, when you move on. Yeah, fantastic. I was going to ask, what would you say, because you went to, to Oxford, how yeah. was that, how did that impact you? What was that experience <laughs> like for you when you got there? Uh, it was hugely impactful. It was a complete culture shock coming mm -hmm. from a comprehensive school in South London to, um, you know, to a place where, you know, with such a high um, uh, 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 Part of the student body coming from the you know, private school, public school sector. I mean, it is it, mm -hmm. and just culturally in every single way, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it was a it, it changed my life basically. It was, it was mm -hmm. completely transformative. Um, I experienced and saw a lot of things and a lot of ideas, encountered a lot of ideas and ways of thinking that I'd never really been exposed to before. You know, um, and it, you know it we you know coming from the background i came from and we weren't very well off you know we hadn't gone on holidays you know really mm -hmm. as a family you know we hadn't mm -hmm. done these things i think i'd been past the m25 like a handful of times in my whole yeah. life so it was yeah. it was just different and you've got suddenly people from um all over the country all over the world some from over the world um but yeah the, in terms of people who come from different backgrounds it was as diverse a place in a completely different kind of diversity completely mm -hmm. diverse in a completely different way um and you know i remember the very i think the very first person i met on the first day i started was this sort of chisel jawed etonian who came up to you and had a little chat called henry it was, and he was very nice i don't think we socialized much after that to be honest but <laughs> um i was you know it just really struck you that you were suddenly surrounded by lots of people who had absolutely or seemed on the outside at least had very little doubt about the, their potential and their place in the world and right. they, they could go on and do amazing things and, yeah. and manage to do it, you know, and manage to yeah. make great use of their time and their opportunities when they were there uh, and were inc incredibly confident and persuasive. And um, um, yeah, well, and it was a real culture shock uh, and took a lot to get used to. But yeah, I have to also say I was very lucky. I actually hugely fortunate to have one very good mate of mine from school yeah actually come to Oxford at the same time and yeah he was a real um you know a fantastic sort of anchor you know yeah. uh, and, and someone to lean on and so that helped a lot and I made good really good friends again friends for life um, yeah. quite quickly and uh really enjoyed the experience you know um uh, just sort of soak, soaks it all up and it was great yeah you, you mentioned just briefly I'm going to just pull you back then mm. at first you, you felt um I'm not going to say out of place, but there was a bit of a struggle. What was that struggle related to? Do you think? I wouldn't say so much struggle. I tell okay. you what, tell you what did I did struggle with was the work. I mean, it right. wasn't okay. easy. Yeah, right? it was it was academically hugely challenging. And you, I suppose, the first thing is you go from a place where you might well be academically one of the top in the school. You know, mm -hmm. and lots of people. It's a sort of cliche, really. People say this, but mm -hmm. um, it is true. You know, you go and then suddenly you're surrounded by people who are the, among the best in their own environment, and yeah. they're very, very good. And the standards are high, and the work you know you're expected to produce great work and learn complicated things very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that wasn't easy. And mm -hmm. it, it's you know, and I'm, perhaps I didn't wasn't sort of mature enough or schooled enough in the sort of how to study very well mm -hmm. to get the most mm -hmm. out of it. So I did find it hard and it took me mm -hmm. a long time to get to grips with 
how I had to apply myself to, to, mm -hmm. to do well in that environment, but I eventually got there. So academically, mm -hmm. it was a challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and to be fair, I, you know, was probably um, spending more time concentrating on those friendships and, and making the most of that than necessarily doing everything I had to do uh, to pass all the exams. But uh, I think, yeah, in a way though, you were given a lot of breathing space to just do it and get on with it. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, you weren't, there wasn't a huge amount of structure to your week. I mean, as scientists, we had more structure because we had lectures in the morning and mm -hmm. we had the tutorial system. So regular mm -hmm. meetings with a tutor and then the rest of it, off you go, it's up to you. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was hard, I think. Um, but I suppose in other respects, I don't, I, yeah, it, it, it was just so different. I think in a way, had I spent so much time pondering about how a new out of place I might have been, it, it yeah. would have been, you know, you could probably put, and I'm not, and I know other people who came from same school or other schools that were similar, not everybody enjoyed it, right? Some people really did struggle. So it depended a lot on, on the groups you ended up with and who you ended up mixing with. Yeah. Um, so I think I was fortunate in that, in that way. Um, but yeah, mostly it was the academic side of it. I think that I struggled and, and found yeah. that hard. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on from from what would you what would you say would be the the most um, impactful thing that you've taken from your experience at Oxford and brought that into your working environment? And what what's kept you motivated um, in the sciences? Hmm. That's a really tough question um, because you take so much with you from that, yeah. I think in terms of, I suppose, just the whole intellectual approach to studying. Okay. Yeah. So the, the whole ethos, I think uh, one big thing that I think makes a difference is the fact compared to say someone like Imperial, where, mm -hmm. which is so focused mm -hmm. on STEM subjects and a scientific method and approach is that actually the diversity of the subjects that you do see people in Oxford and you see a lot of people and a lot of academics who, for whom, you know, it, it's much more vocational, right? It's their, well, at least it, you know, it, it depends of, we are here to, you know, preserve as well as generate human knowledge for the good of everyone. Yeah. And, and, and mm -hmm. to pass that on. Uh, and that's sort of sense of vocation that you're studying something. It's not just about a means to an end. It's not mm -hmm. entirely utilitarian. It's about, um, you know, uh, revering knowledge and it's for its own sake to mm -hmm. a certain degree and I think that's something quite inspirational um, mm -hmm. and and also the importance of, of passing that on um, which is you know I guess I was always motivated to be a teacher of yeah. some kind it just happened to be in, in university education yeah that's something I've sort of taken on as well that it, it, there's a responsibility to, to, to pass on that knowledge yeah um, as well um, I think also how oh, just you know you've got to be bold and and try and take opportunities mm -hmm. um, um i think you look back now and i think had i been more confident and mm -hmm. i suppose you know i would you said struggle earlier it wasn't a struggle but definitely you were in maybe intimidated somewhat out of certain things if you didn't right. think you'd, whatever you didn't take part in certain things i look mm -hmm. back a little bit and regret now actually i wish i'd done a little bit more mm -hmm. um had a bit more confidence to take, to take on certain things and get more out of the situation Mm -hmm. um, and certainly going forward, you know, to try and take those chances. Um, I think it's easier when you're younger, or at least I found it easier to be bold and, take, and not worry, be a little less fearful about what others think, or am I good enough mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Some of that creeps in later down the line is the more you realise what you don't know, <laughs> the more you really realize how good other people, you know, you can get intimidated. But yeah, I think just being bold and taking those chances is um, uh, really important. Um, uh, but I guess just the main thing was just that there was so much to learn and so much yeah. to do and taking that inspiration and, and just enjoying that and wanting to keep that sense of enjoying discovery, yeah. and gaining new knowledge and doing interesting things with it and teaching other people about it is what has kept me in academia. Uh, all this. Day. I want to ask a question which is kind of like bringing us a bit closer to home at Imperial because mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've been at Imperial for a, a good number of years now, mm -hmm. right? Um, comparing and contrasting your experience, what would you say um, has kept you going at Imperial? How has your Imperial yeah. experience been? So, so uh, yeah, I suppose 
it seems to almost to have, you've always got people who come in, in two camps in academia mm -hmm. and, you know in the institutions like imperial so people mm -hmm. who sort of start at the bottom and then go the way through which is mm -hmm. what i've done so i've been mm -hmm. in Imperial over 20 years now mm -hmm. um or you get it is it does recruit from a very international pool so you get a lot of people that sort of come mm -hmm. in and there is some dynamism there as well but i think yeah i'm certainly one of those people that start at the bottom and stayed a very long time mm -hmm. what's kept me here is it's lots of things um it is a fantastic place to work you know if you want to do scientific research i mean the mm -hmm. opportunities are huge mm -hmm. there's a lot of exciting things going on all the time in many different areas and lots of opportunities to sort of work cross discipline as well yeah. which is where often a lot of the most exciting things happen mm -hmm. and but yeah in terms of belonging here and enjoying working here a lot of that's come down to the, obviously the personal relationships you build along the way the friendships mm -hmm. you build along the way mm -hmm. and i've just been really yeah again really lucky to have made really good friendships early on with academic colleagues um that has you know stood the test of time yeah. and, and helped propel me all the way through to to the position i am in now and uh yeah i think you know and and you know that's not to say there aren't times when you think things aren't going so well and you sort of think why am i doing this and <laughs> you do have those moments but i suppose i've always managed to have enough progress enough success to get me over those difficult patches at the time yeah um uh you know and and things pick up and and and, and go on i think the i suppose the other thing that motivates there's always something new around the corner you know the, the what i'm doing and the nature of the job i'm doing all the interactions you have with other people are always evolving all the time yeah um so you obviously early in your career you're really thinking about your own very focused on your own ideas and your own projects as you know the stage i'm at now you spend a lot of time thinking about how to build up, up the careers of people around you as well you know yeah. and get their ideas on the table and funded and yeah. supported um, um as well as maybe doing more in terms of you know uh, uh, interact with lots of other staff around their roles in say yeah. education or other things as well so there's always something new i've enjoyed it it's a hugely dynamic and exciting place um i suppose i should also acknowledge that there is the personal draw of you know your my my wife also worked in london there was you know, i was fortuitous in the first place i i almost did a postdoc in the us um and just you know uh, last minute that job disappeared and i ended up applying for some imperial completely randomly yeah happened to get in the right place at the right time in terms of the field I study I was in it was just growing just being born at that time yeah um and that was also you know important in staying because there were lots yeah. of opportunities as a result of that and so again a bit of luck but also having the opportunity then my wife came to London trained as a solicitor and you know, it, having your personal life happened to be compatible with staying around in London at the time and I know that's a huge challenge for a lot of people in academia that often to get the next opportunity it, it is there you they have to move yeah. you know there's no there's not necessarily an opportunity locally and, and that puts a lot of challenge on people and families yeah um and it's something i've been fortunate in not having to navigate yeah. you know, those issues quite so um severely so i've had some luck in that regard as well yeah, yeah. i was, was going to ask a, another question which is along this journey because you've been here a, mm. a, a, a while right and um, not saying that you're old or anything like that but you've been here a while and um has there been any kind of like mentors or sponsors or people who have helped you because i'm thinking about your background mm. it's not like you your parents could have said to you go and check someone here or go and check some no. so you've had to work your way and has there been anyone along the way who has has kind of like taken you under your their wing uh, and uh, and helped you along uh, yes i mean lots of people and and I, I would say absolutely in you know it's a it's a requisite you can't i mean i not okay so you can't I, I i can see it being extremely difficult to progress if you didn't have that mentorship right mm -hmm. um but you so yeah you need the support support of senior people around you mm -hmm. um uh, you know, and sometimes they, those relationships aren't always easy, mm -hmm. as I would say, in terms of people who manage you. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you do need their support and you need to get, find ways of getting the most out of that. But yes, there's always been those other people as well who haven't really had necessarily any vested interest at all, who've been kind and enough and generous enough to sit you down and just have a chat with you and say, how are you doing? And, and, let, and, and let you talk to them 
and give you support and advice and encouragement when you need it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's particularly Professor Nigel Goodham, who's a consul and, and senior colleague um, here in Pilnie, recently retired, who was really quite important. Um, and there have been others, again, another person who's recently retired, Professor Bob Brown, who um, encouraged me to, at one point to move division within the faculty, which gave me a, um, yeah, a new lease of life to my research career mm -hmm. and, and, and gave me a huge amount of opportunities. So, mm -hmm. and then people I'm still working with now, um, there's a Professor Charlotte Bevan, who's just you know been a, a few years up above me in terms of mm -hmm. her career progression, but over many, many years, you know, has, has been an encouraging and supporting and a great collaborator. Um, so and there are many others I could name, but I think, yeah, absolutely, you do need those people and you need that support. Academia is a long term game, right? Yeah. So that support you do need maybe over five, 10 years or more, you know, mm -hmm. kind of period. And so even if you are to leave those relationships, that network that you build up amongst other academic colleagues is really important and to mm -hmm. have people to sound things off and, and to be honest with. because That's the other yeah. thing It's really having honest conversations is difficult. Right. Yeah. It, it, to have that with your boss with other people being having those people you can be really honest with and they can be really honest with you and sometimes you know and you know um try and um say you know whether they think you're overplaying something or whatever but just being being honest about it um that's really really important yeah yeah that's brilliant i'm gonna open it up it's it's just gone one o'clock i'm gonna open it up to see if there's anyone in the who's listening in today if they have any questions which they would like to ask otherwise i always have another couple of questions which I always want to know. Are there any, if you want to just raise your hand, otherwise or, um, I'll just ask another question. At the moment, I don't see any. Okay, so what I'm gonna ask is in the field which you're currently working in, okay, international mm. field, do you gain, do you have that sense of respect um understanding of the field from other individuals within that field and how yeah do you do you have that sense that people you know kind of in enjoy what you're doing or or respect your work as it were well it's, it's always really hard to know how you stand in other mm -hmm. people's eyes mm -hmm. um you know and i guess that yeah you got i've gone through phases in my life of being sort of self-confident enough, I suppose, cocky enough not to care. <laughs> but <laughs> after all, you do care. And actually, obviously, it, it, in terms of progressioning an academic career, what your peers think of you actively makes a difference, right? It mm. actually makes a difference of whether you get promoted or recruited at a senior mm -hmm. position. Um, other colleagues review your grants and papers and mm. you know, inevitably what they think about you as an individual, um, you know, probably does make a difference. And uh, uh, so I think looking at my career progression and you know um i think there's enough evidence there that that that, that enough people out there in my field think highly enough of my work mm -hmm. that i've been able to to reach um you know uh, this position of, of having a professor position at imperial college which is mm -hmm. you know something to be you know, yeah. not to be sniffed at and yeah. the and you know where you know looking at the where we published a work and the people I've met at conference and I speak to, you know, yeah, I think those relationships are there and people mm -hmm. do, you know, I've never had any sense that people, um, you know, uh, were very negative or looked down on your work, but you know, you know, you never know. I mean, scientists can be, when, when you're really let off the loose, you know, loose, you can, they can be quite uh, brutal about things if they don't think something's up to scratch. Um, mm -hmm. And actually that's something that probably yeah, that's certainly been an academic tradition that mm -hmm. you know the discussions about work can be quite adversarial it's it, certainly in the uk you know we retain this thing with our phd viva that's it's mm -hmm. quite adversarial mm -hmm. yeah and that's simply not the case in other countries mm -hmm. so a lot part of our training i suppose that's one thing that you do get from that sort of oxbridge tradition is that actually how you discuss and debate with you still however polite can mm -hmm. still be quite adversarial and confrontational in terms of mm -hmm. ideas and yeah. trying to get one idea to win over another. So being prepared to defend against that is actually a great skill and probably one of those other sort of slightly intangible skills that you pick up from coming through that Oxbridge environment mm -hmm. that you learn to fight and defend your ideas um, and defend your record a bit as well. Um, 
and perhaps something that comes more naturally to, to kids who come from you know public school public school yeah uh, as well they you know there's there's more of a um uh, a natural acquisition of those skills during during that time in in, in their education and uh, something you have to learn along the way perhaps um if you're not from that background fantastic i'm, I'm just trying to i'm just trying to think of mm. when was it that you decide did you have in mind that you wanted to be a professor <laughs> or, or or did it just kind of like creep up on you did so, you have aspirations to say uh, I'm staying in academia, okay. I'm going all the way to the top. Uh, so apparently when I was um, three or four, um, the first job I ever wanted was to be a dustman because I really liked their coats, <laughs> the overcoat. I said, I want to be a dustman, I want to wear those coats. And then a, a little while later, apparently I said, I did want to be a professor. But then some of the, my, the kids at school said, took the mick out of me and said, oh, it means you have to have glasses at the end of your nose and you, you, know, you look stupid. So I ditched that idea at the time. Um, you know, I just want to be. A, um, I think, look, you always want progression, yeah. right? And in academia, there is a real step change to having that professorial title mm -hmm. and to, uh, you know, uh, or no, in, in the you know US or other places, a full professor versus you know, an associate professor, mm -hmm. what have you. So yeah, so look, I think if, if once you're on. The equivalent of tenure track or the, the, these academic posts, then yes, it's always going to be part of the ambition. The expectation is to is to try and achieve that, right? Mm -hmm. I, but I think I want to distinguish between trying to achieve the title for its own sake mm -hmm. versus the the opportunities it gives you, right? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you want to be have as much control over your own fate as possible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, being you know, getting to that. Uh, point you know gives you you know a different yeah it gives, it gives you more security i guess and, mm -hmm. and, and a different seat at the table um, mm -hmm. um comes along with more expectation obviously of mm -hmm. what you have to deliver but um yeah i think it's it's a natural part of academia to want to uh, achieve and, and and go as far as you can yeah um i think what is often not very clear to people is what you actually have to do to get there yeah. Um, and of course, every academic journey is different. Yeah. But um, I think I was very unaware when mm -hmm. I started out, you know, as a, even as a PhD student, you know, as a postdoc, what it actually took to progress. And I think, you know, academia, you end up being, particularly in the sciences, essentially like a small startup manager. You know, yeah. you have to manage small teams of people doing very device, diverse things. Um, budgets, you have to sell your ideas constantly to your your colleagues, your funders, to journals. Mm -hmm. um, it's like being a startup owner, or something mm -hmm. along those lines. And you know, uh, and that is absolutely not what you're trained for. <laughs> 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 As a PhD, or at least, at least historically, I think there are many examples of, of doctoral training colleges and centres in, in Imperial that are doing a great job of this and actually bringing mm -hmm. in a lot more of this entrepreneur mindset or these mm -hmm. these other sorts of skills. And I think there is a transition of that across academia at the moment. But mm -hmm. yeah, in my generation, you see, it certainly wasn't pitched to you that way. It was yeah. all about focusing on this crystal clarity around this idea and developing and that. So. Um, I think what I've been, or I think the reason I've stuck, you know, you stick it out, is you have enough success to be allowed the opportunity to stay in. Yeah. And I've always enjoyed the journey. You've got to enjoy the day-to-day -day stuff. So it wasn't necessarily about reaching that milestone. It was, that is a natural progression of staying in the game long enough, getting yeah. enough success to get there. Uh, at least that's what it felt like to me. Others may, may disagree, but that's what it felt like to me. Um, so for you, it was more of the day-to-day -day challenge of the of the research which kept mm. you motivated and almost like the acquisition of the titles came almost as a as a byproduct to the process yeah i hope i'm not and i hope i'm not sort of putting on sort of rose tinted testicles about it too much but yeah that, i think that's probably fair you you've got definitely you've got to enjoy the everyday of it yeah you know i think once that becomes too difficult or you know you don't feel motivated to, to fight through and keep going for that success then i think mm -hmm. yeah it is hard to stay in it um uh, you've got to feel that you're contributing to something bigger you know mm -hmm. that you're, you know, um and you know and again so and, and I, I think 
part of the thing in academia is because the, the goals are very long term. You know, you are thinking yeah. about things over a two, three, four, five year period before mm-hmm. some things really pay off and really mm-hmm. come to fruition. Come to fruition. So um, that takes a certain mindset to keep mm-hmm. going um, um, through that. And also you've got to be a bit strategic about it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and that's where I would advise people, you know, get as much advice from many different sources as you can. You don't have to agree with it all. And certainly going right back to sort of a head of six one said, I couldn't do it. You know, yeah. you've got to at some point know when to sort of push back and say, actually, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. But get that wide advice, try and understand why they're giving that advice and and try and as much as you can sort of make a, a value judgment about how you might, you know, get around that particular problem. So certainly uh, get as many opinions as you can. I think the key, I think one of the things about, I've always appreciated having a diverse set of opinions that right. diversity is, I, I can recognize the value of it, but the diversity comes from ideas, it's diversity of ideas, yeah. diversity of backgrounds and ways of thinking. It doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be represented in equal proportions that is in the whole country or whatever, but you yeah. do need that diversity of thinking in order to come up with good ways of doing things and progressing yourself and, uh, and the others around you. Brilliant. I've got one more question. The audience have just, they're just sitting back enjoying the conversation. <laughs> okay. so, so I'm going to just ask you my final question. What advice, I, I, I like the fact that you wanted to be a dustman because of the, uh, because of the coat, but I'm, I'm not going to take it down there. Okay, okay. What, what advice would you give, would you have given to your 16 year old self as to where they would, where you would end up and how to get there? I don't know. Uh, stop mucking around. <laughs> uh, you know, um, don't be so arrogant. You know, take a bit of advice. Um, do work harder to try and understand um, why people are saying to you what they're saying. You know, right. um, don't immediately dismiss. Try and, if you don't agree with something, don't immediately dismiss it. Yeah. Um, do try and uh, understand the counterpoint and the alternative point of view. Um, don't uh, uh, don't make decisions out of fear. Don't fear failure. You know, mm-hmm. um, decisions made out of fear or aren't usually the best ones. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, try and be try and understand the risks or the risks and benefits of any particular choice. But yeah, try and um, um, be confident, be bold, and have some faith in yourself and, and go for it. Um, I know that's a fine line between that and being cocky, but I think the main thing is. Um, is how much you take on board, you know, the advice of, of others and seek that advice widely and be bold in asking for that advice. Okay, so, so it's, it's a transition from your natural ability, mm. which you know you have, to the position where you also need to be able to take advice from others. And I'd say one other thing as well is don't, you know, don't necessarily fall into that mindset is quite important don't follow the negative mindset of thinking it's all too, it's all decided for me and it's all a fix and it's all a fiddle i remember acutely you know at one point i think towards the end of my phd they do a sort of careers thing that you go yeah. on and you go in groups and they and i remember we were talking about one thing about what were your ambitions and what you want to do and at what that point i was very interested in education but i i sort of commented with some frustration that you know let's say one day i want to be minister for education in a government yeah. that would never happen you would never have a person of yeah, you know, of kind of being a, a minister in a government in this country, yeah. right? And I said that, and no one c- contradicted me at the time, right? Yeah. Because obviously everybody else thought that was also likely to be the case. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can say that now. And every, sometimes you have to be the first, right, yeah. to, to go in and do that. And I think, so I think I was too negative at that point in, right. in my life about these things. And, um, and I don't want... I don't really I don't mean that as an example about ethnicity specifically. Yeah, I, understand. I mean I mean that as a principle of saying just because nobody else has done it doesn't mean you doesn't can't. Doesn't mean yeah. So if you have to be the first, be the first. If exactly. you yeah. Yeah, I understand that totally. Hector, it's been brilliant having you on and hearing your experience. And I want to just say another really big thank you for sharing those experiences. I know we could sit here and we could talk for, we haven't even touched on the educational aspects and stuff. And I know that you're very into that as well. Um, But I just wanna say a really big thank you and continue to um, shine the light, continue to lead the pathway in the field which you're doing because you're doing a great job. Um, So 
thank you very much. Very kind of you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on. I'm going to just share with everyone what's going to be on next week. And our guest next week is VJ Timms. Um, and VJ is a principal teaching fellow in physics at Imperial. And he's going to be joining us next week to share his, um, his belonging experience. And if you haven't had the opportunity to see some of the others, or you want to just catch up on on some of the interviews which we've done in the past, please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO, and you'll be able to see all of the other videos there. Um, before I go, just want to remind everyone the clocks go forward this weekend, and it's also Mother Mother's Day on Sunday. So please don't forget, right, either of them. Right, and don't give the excuse, oh, I missed the time, right? Just, just make sure you get your mother that present, all right? Okay, guys, have a good week, um, and I will see you again next week. Thanks a lot for joining. Bye, everyone.